Todas las personas pueden escribir, pueden hacer cualquier cosa, se tienen que emancipar. Ningún libro verdadero tiene ni una primera ni una última página. Con el significado de que se recoge a sí mismo. I'm back, I'm writing short stories now. And, uh, but nothing set in the pandemic. Cada vez que al poema se le imponía la palabra yo, sentía como si de golpe se hubiera metido en la camisa de otra persona. Antes soñaba sapos con lentejuelas. Ese es el sueño más lindo que tuve. Me dedicó la semana entera a quejarse y suspirar. Pero el sábado a la noche me dijo, mañana quedaste que tengo un plan. Dice palabras que te ayudan a sobrevivir. Muchas gracias. Hola, bienvenidas, bienvenidos, gracias por estar acá del otro lado en esta tercera actividad virtual de esta decimocuarta edición del Festival Internacional de Literatura de Buenos Aires, FILBA. Ayer tuvimos el enorme placer de conversar con Andrea Wolf el jueves con David Abram, eh, actividades que pueden verse y reverse en nuestro canal de YouTube, al igual que este lujo que nos vamos a dar ahora de conversar y escuchar y conocer a Shane Lazar. A través de, de experiencias personales y de la memoria familiar, la escritora y periodista estadounidense Shane Lazar analiza aristas de nuestro presente como el colonialismo, el racismo y sus sesgos políticos en la contemporaneidad. Ella es escritora de ficción, de no ficción, de poesía. Algunos de sus libros cuya lectura recomendamos fervorosamente son El comunista y la hija del comunista, Más allá de la blancura de la blancura, Memorias de una madre blanca de hijos negros y El nudo materno, un libro que a pesar de los años eh, que tiene escrito, tiene una vigencia tremenda y es un, un libro que vuelve a circular traducido en Argentina. Eh, en esta conversación, la que repasará parte de su trayectoria y de, de sus constelaciones literarias, nos guiará en la charla la argentina Florencia Abate, escritora, doctora en letras, investigadora en el campo de la literatura. El foco que, que ha venido trabajando Abate es, son las relaciones entre estética política y los estudios de género. Actualmente Florencia Abate también dirige el área de letras del Fondo Nacional de las Artes. Agradecemos muchísimo a ellas dos por sumarse a este festival y agradecemos también a la Embajada de Estados Unidos en Argentina por la colaboración para que esta actividad sea posible. Muchísimas gracias a todos y todas por estar acá y disfrutemos de la conversación. Hi Jane. Hi. To Argentina. Um, it is a pleasure for me to have this possibility uh, to make the interview with you. And as I told you by email, uh, I felt uh, a strong affinity for your work when I discovered. Uh, so I, I prepared some questions for you. Mm -hmm. um, well, let me just say, Florentia, that I learned about your history, a little bit of your history as an organizer. And also I read the story that you wrote that was based on real, a real mm -hmm. experience. And I was very struck by the power of the story mm -hmm. and also very admiring of the work oh. <laughs> yeah, Argentina. And it really does um it really does overlap 
in some ways with what I've been writing about all my life of the relationship between uh, political awareness and political um, and historical awareness and the work of an artist. Well, well my, my first question was uh, uh, that in certain way, uh, your, your writing work uh, can be seen uh, as a, let's say, a, a sort of exploration of the feminist idea that the states that the personal is political. Uh, so um, could you tell us uh, how and when you discovered that the personal is political? Well, I guess um, there were several stages of that mm -hmm. awareness in me. I, w I wouldn't have called it that when I was a child growing up with my father, who was um, a leading com American communist. He was an immigrant, as you know. Uh, and I wrote about him in my book, The Communist and the Communist Daughter. But, in, but we were taught so much as children and as we were growing up, and he died when I was in my middle 20s. But up until that time, we were taught so much about history and politics mm -hmm. as being part of our internal lives. So they would not have called it that. But the idea that those two realms were connected and overlapped mm -hmm. were always mm -hmm. a part of my consciousness. Like uh, James Baldwin put it, a people mm -hmm. are trapped in history and history is trapped in them. Mm -hmm. Then when I was in my 20s and, and active in the American feminist movement that began in the late 60s when I was also pregnant with my first child, that phrase, the personal is political, became one of the... Um, defining principles and sentences of the mm -hmm. feminist movement here. And mm -hmm. it was then the third part of it was intensified when I became a teacher. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to teach the intersections of motherhood and race because my children are black. My mm -hmm. children who are now very grown up men, but that my ch I raised them and with the help of my husband and my mother-in-law who are African-American. Mm -hmm. So race and motherhood and teaching and the intellectual work that I was doing, which involved, always involved the issue of racial politics in this mm -hmm. country and also feminism in this mm -hmm. country. Everything was connected for me. Yeah, of course. Yeah, in some of your books, yeah, you, you talk about racism, you know, drawing on, on your experience you know, as, as the wife of an African-American man and the, a white mother, as you say, of two black children, no? And how do you, do you feel um, that um, your understanding of racism um, has changed because of that experience? And the second question is um, uh, how the reading of black feminist authors also contributed to that understanding. Right. Well, I don't think it's um, in Spanish yet, mm -hmm. but Magda in 2023 is going to publish another memoir I wrote called Beyond the Whiteness of Whiteness, mm -hmm. Memoir of a White Mother of Black Sons. Mm -hmm. So that book tells the story that you're asking about in terms of my personal life, mm -hmm. uh, which was then intensified by my own writing and teaching life, mm -hmm. uh, where I learned, I really learned so much. I mean, I was brought up to be anti-racist in a mm -hmm. communist family, but there was still a lot of ignorance mm -hmm. among white mm -hmm. people, even on the left who were anti-racist, but didn't really understand some of the aspects of American racism. That I learned very fast and very intensely when I joined my husband's family. Okay. Um, I learned from him. I learned from my mother-in-law and my father-in-law who died also very young. Mm -hmm. and his whole family 
um, about, but also at the time I was teaching high school and all of my students were black and Latino, Latina and Latino. Most of them then were Puerto Rican, now more Dominican and uh, Mexican. But uh, I learned a great deal about racism and the history of racism and what I began to understand about white skin privilege in this country uh, during that period in my 20s and 30s and even into my 40s. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, well, most uh, feminist groups here in Argentina uh, have strongly embraced the intersectional perspective. And, I didn't uh, hear that, I'm sorry. Yeah, that most of uh, feminist groups here in Argentina um, uh, have strongly embraced the intersectional perspective. And oh. I feel this is one of the, one thing that um, we, we all, uh, the feminist debates uh, from the 70s, you know. Um, and well, I, I was uh, thinking about your, your father too. Uh, one of the most um, like powerful moments uh, for me uh, in your book, uh, The Communist and the Communist Daughter, uh, is when you finish the, the chapter 10 uh, with the line, uh, they didn't live uh, only for themselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. let's, uh, let's explain for people who's listening that this is an epitaph that you found uh, in the Long Island Cemetery near yeah. the, the burial place of your mother and, and your uncle. No? Yeah. Um, in, in another scene, um, you narrate the, the last time you, you saw your father, no? uh, and it was cold, no? and he, he took out uh, uh, his glove, no? And, and gave them to you, no? Um, and his, what was the last thing? The, the other scene is, is when you narrate the last time you saw your father. Mm? Oh, he, yes. he took out his gloves and, and his gave father. them to you, no? Yeah. So yeah. I, I found these two scenes uh, very, very touching. Um, yeah. So um, that this idea, uh, what can you tell us about the, this idea they didn't live only for themselves? And how would you connect it with our present? That's a very good question, Florentia. Um, I'm struck today with all the, all the political upheaval that's going on in this country now, mm -hmm. the threats to democracy, all of the terrible um, white supremacy that has resurfaced in this country since Trump was uh, elected, although it was always there, but it blew up and surfaced during Trump's uh, presidency. And especially uh, with Black Lives Matter going on in this country, helping so many people who didn't understand much, understand a lot more after the killing of George Floyd, which was responded to all over the world. Yeah. But it all reminded me in a very humble way of how uh, my father and his comrades all were so dedicated to living uh, their lives to try and make what they called a better world. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one part of it. And that was um, in some ways, obviously very connected to his going to Spain to fight in the Spanish Civil War again. There I go again. And, uh, yeah. and so that has been continued. I have inherited that mm -hmm. has been mostly as a teacher. I was very active as a young feminist, but mm -hmm. um, then when I had children and I was teaching, I mostly expressed my own political activism as a teacher. And that's when I learned a great deal even more about the history of African-American literature and history in this country from writers like Baldwin and Toni Morrison and Alice mm -hmm. Walker and many, many others. Um, mm -hmm. I taught them to mm -hmm. classes, which um, 
which I've described in the newest book, mm -hmm. A Writer in yeah. Time, A Woman Writer in yeah. Time. In that book, um, you, you talk about uh, using writing uh, to tell true stories and counter false stories. Uh, could you could you expand uh, your view about the relationship between activism and writing? That is a theme uh, that I've been struggling to being able to write about really ever since the mother knot. Mm -hmm. Even though the mother knot El Nudo Muturno in Spanish edition yeah. uh, was a personal story about mm -hmm. how I um, experienced the first identity crisis of mm -hmm. becoming a mother. It also had turned out to be a useful uh, book for helping other women and organizing mm -hmm. other women who are, and I learned this recently from interviews from Mexican mothers and Chilean mothers and uh, now in Argentina um, with um, helping other women understand mm -hmm. their own ambivalences and the crisis really in identity of becoming a mother. So that was my first understanding intellectually of the way that organizing and creative writing as it's called um, are connected. You know a lot about that from your own work. And I have been very inspired by people like James Baldwin, who wrote about his own life mm -hmm. so often, but also was an organizer during the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And well, the, the maternal note or was, was published for the first time in 1976, no? Yes. Um, and now uh, has been translated into uh, Spanish and republished uh, recently, uh, well, in a totally different context, no? let's say. Um, and do you know if the, the new mothers uh, who read the book uh, nowadays uh, still feel uh, strongly identified uh, with the guilty feelings? Because you talk a lot about uh, that, uh, the guilty feelings in mothers, no? Oh. I'm sorry, the last part of what you yeah. said. So yeah. I did, was, in that book, uh, you talk a lot uh, about guilty feelings in mothers. Uh, and do you know if the new mothers who read the book uh, nowadays still feel strongly identified uh, with those feelings? When I was in Spain, uh, in Barcelona, when the book was first published, I was amazed and very moved by how many younger mothers were so influenced and helped by that book. And lately I've been, I've had the same feelings from, as I said, Mexican and Chilean mothers who have interviewed me uh, since they've read the book. Unfortunately, even though a lot of people are talking about motherhood now in this country ever since the Supreme Court decision outlawing abortion in this country. A lot of people are talking about motherhood again, but my book, The Mother Not, even though it's still in, um, in, it's still available from Duke University Press, it's not uh, widely known in this country now. And so I'm trying to get it reissued mm -hmm. by another press if I can, or, mm -hmm to get Duke University Press to publicize it more, which I don't think they can do for their own reasons. Um, but yes, whenever mothers read it, and I'm now a grandmother of uh, somebody who's 21 years old, but so when young mothers who have children, whether they're in my family or friends or mm -hmm. people I don't know, read it and identify with it and are moved by it, it's a confirmation of the relationship between political and historical work and the work of creative memoir. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And well, you have written a lot about uh, family ties, no? Uh, about being a, a mother, being a daughter, uh, being a wife, 
being a daughter-in-law also, no, even being a sister. Um, I, I was wondering uh, if we could think uh, about the notion of family uh, in the same way that Adrian Rich uh, thought uh, about uh, motherhood as an institution, but also uh, as an experience. Yes. And I would like to know uh, what is your view of family as an institution and as an experience? That's a very good question also. I was very influenced by Adrian Rich's Of Woman Born, no. uh, which was published right when The Mother Knot was first published here. So I knew her through our books. And I was also very influenced by Tilly Olson, mm -hmm. who wrote uh, beautiful stories about motherhood, which also was published in Spanish by uh, Las Afueras. Oh, okay. Tell me a riddle. She published Tell Me a Riddle in Spanish, mm -hmm. um, which is also a very, very important classic about the institution and the experience of motherhood and how they often clash. Um, the institution of the family, as you and I both know, are often and historically has always been very, very oppressive to women. So wherever there's a feminist movement that gains energy and movement, wherever that happens in the world, and I know it's happening very much in South America now, many countries in South America, wherever that happens, there's a very important critique of the family and the mother's or the woman's role in the family. So I've written a lot about that. On, and intertwined with that mm -hmm. is the emotional experience mm -hmm. of being a mother, being married, if you're fortunate like I am, to a long-standing partner who you love mm -hmm. and are devoted to. Those, and in my case, also extended to his family and especially to my mother-in-law. Um, those deep feel, feel, and also to my own family, who many of whom are still uh, living and I'm very close to uh, my sister, my, her daughter and son, my niece and nephew, uh, my cousin, one of my cousins. But those, those relationships are still the bedrock of my life. So my emotional um, love for and connection to and my intimacy with my sons, first of all, and my husband are really the foundation of my life. And everyone asks me all the time about the mother knot, especially when I was read when I was going to a lot of colleges and classrooms and talking about it, about that contradiction between all the negative feelings that I expressed. Yeah. And when I, when I went to Barcelona, when the Mother Knot was published there, my sons came with me. So I was worried that they would reread it and their feelings would be hurt. But no, they were very supportive of it. They understood, they understood the conflict and they never questioned my love for them. But really it is a conflict between what Adrian Rich called the institution, which has to be critiqued. Mm -hmm. It's always throughout history been difficult and oppressive to women. Mm -hmm. And the experience of mm -hmm. intimacy and love mm -hmm. for one's family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not that mm -hmm. that's the case. There are many families that are broken, where mm -hmm. intimacy is broken, and where violence, as Adrian Rich wrote about it, is common. So I don't mm -hmm. want to idealize the experience. Mm -hmm. Of course. Yeah, and um, uh, through through the narration of your family history in your work, no, uh, one can see a, a line of activism uh, that goes uh, from your communist father, no, passing through you and your feminist activism, and to your your son, no, especially the youngest, no, Carrie. Um, 
So, uh, do you do you believe in the generational transmission, the importance of the generational transmissions, or values that uh, make someone become an activist? Uh, and do you think um, this transmission is mostly conscious or unconscious? <laughs> I think it's both, Florence. Oh. I, I think it has to be both. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's, I don't, if it were just unconscious, I don't think it transmits mm -hmm. automatically. Um, although anyone who's a mother of grown-up children, uh, I'm sure your mother, if you if you still are connected mm -hmm. to her, will tell you, you can see the connections between your own parents' temperaments and character and your own children. But I do, but also my husband was very active in civil rights against segregation and Jim Crow. And so was his whole family growing up in the South during segregation. And um, so we both came from politically active families, excuse me. And so we made a very conscious effort to teach and convey the values that we had grown up with to our sons as they were growing up. And so the values that I had learned from my communist upbringing mm -hmm. were transmitted to both of my sons. And my older son, who's a writer and an actor in California and Hollywood, he has written several scripts. I don't think they've been, uh, the, I know that they haven't been um, screened yet most of them, but he has written several scripts and he teaches these values through his writing. And my younger son, Kari, is the executive director of a uh, nonprofit organization here called Brotherhood yeah. Sister Soul. I serve on the board of that organization and that organization really carries on and he carries on the legacy of his yeah. grandfather in his yeah. organization. That, yeah, yeah. And, and you have said uh, that um, in America, um, racism has been used uh, to divide the working class. Mm -hmm. uh, could, could you explain a bit uh, this idea? And this idea, I think, is finally inching upwards into the general American consciousness, although just inching upwards. But many writers and historians have written about it. Mm -hmm. African-American writers and academics and scholars have written about it, and some white writers have written about it, that all throughout American history, white poor white people and working mm -hmm. class white people have in a sense been bought off by racism. In other words, there are so many instances in which white working people in this country vote against their own interests mm -hmm. because they are, they are convinced that their own interests are socialism, which mm -hmm. they're taught to hate. Mm -hmm. and they're convinced that black people and people uh, of color in general are taking away their jobs. So mm -hmm. instead of um, aligning themselves throughout history, most of the time, with other working class people, mm -hmm. black and people of color, mm -hmm. they've, there's been a, a, a very destructive separation mm -hmm. of, in this country. And racism is the, um, is the wall that has separated uh, people from each other. Mm -hmm. and it's been a long-standing and very negative force in American political life, and still is. And of course, it was exploited very much by Trump. Yeah, yeah. Do you think uh, uh, nowadays there, there is a, a sort of uh, return of fascism at a, at a global scale? Because we are seeing, for example, we are watching Brazil and, you know, Bolsonaro and... and during the pandemic, it was really shocking. No? We're, many of us are very worried and scared about that. Um, everybody wants to be very, very careful about the use of language. 
although even Biden used the word fascism in a recent mm -hmm. speech uh, to talk mm -hmm. about some of the um, extreme right-wing Republicans who were in favor of and supported the January 6th insurrection. So mm -hmm. the answer to your question is yes, there's a big fear in this country that there is a very dangerous white supremacist and fascist mm -hmm. anti-immigrant you've seen it recently in the immigration issue with the venezuelans mm -hmm. uh, but um all over south and central america the immigration issues and the terrible crisis that has resulted on our borders all of that has made us um, very wary and frightened and May, it caused a lot of people on the left to work harder and harder to try and counter that force in this country. Okay. Well, let's talk about uh, uh, fascism during the 30s, <laughs> uh, about your book, um, The Communist and the Communist Daughter, uh, the one that I love, <laughs> I have to say. Um, and, um, well, you know uh, that Argentina uh, has been one of the countries from where more communist militants uh, went to, to Spain to fight uh, during the civil war. And, yeah. and well, I, I always feel uh, it was one of the moments in, in history uh, when international solidarity and hope for a better future were really strong. Um, could you think of any other historical situation uh, in which this kind of engagement uh, surfaced again? And, and, and what, what does the Spanish Civil War mean to you? You mean, can I, do I have hope that it would happen again in the world similarly that i don't know that i don't know whether it would or how history is going to play out this time mm -hmm. um but i can tell you that uh in this book um in this new book that come that just came out mm -hmm. uh that i think you have a woman writer in time the first essay was um, was called Motherhood as Activism. And really the whole first part of that essay was about my father because I was in Spain. And it all brought back to me what I had researched already by then in The Communist and the Communist Daughter and what I had learned. I had learned everything about the Spanish Civil War as a child because it was almost mythological in our childhood growing up. Um, as I say in that book, I had cousins whose middle names, they were girls, but they had male middle, middle names because their oh. uncle had been, had been killed in Spain. Ah, okay. So the, uh, it, the whole, ex the whole uh, um, example of the Spanish Civil War was very much a myth for us as we were growing up. Mm -hmm. Um, when I went to Spain, I was overwhelmed by being in the places where mm -hmm. all of the battles that I had read about had happened and where so much Spanish resistance had been so courageous. And mm -hmm. I felt a new sense of pride in my father and his participation in the Spanish Civil War. But I had already written the book, so I already had incorporated a lot of his experiences. And that's why... In the book, I also um, have quoted a lot of experiences that he had from his FBI file in this yeah. country, but I also used fiction to go into his own point of view yeah. and try to imagine how he felt about his life um, as a person who always, who never really lost his faith mm -hmm. that there could be a struggle for what he called what they all called a better world, mm -hmm. yeah. a world where there was more justice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, he, he was a, a man who experienced uh, a lot of sadness, no? the, the defeat in Spain. He oh. was, uh, excuse me, he was what? Yeah. I, I think it, 
and yeah, okay, 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 again. <laughs> he was a man to, to experience uh, a lot of sadness, um, the defeat in his pain, you know, the, the loss of his wife and mother of his daughters, uh, the shock of the Second uh, World War, um, yeah. the, the persecution during McCarthyism, you no. Know? Uh, and and uh, and after he then after he gave all for the communist party uh, he also suffered the accusations of his own comrades you know uh, yeah. who was uh, demoted by the party um, and yeah. but but despite uh, all, all of this uh, in his farewell letter uh, he chose to to focus uh, in in the happiness of his life, you know? So well, he, that's true. He, yeah. he was an immigrant, a Jewish yeah. immigrant from what's now Moldova, was then, Kish, was then part of Russia and Romania. Um, and he had all of the sadness and tendency to depression um, mm -hmm. that any of the people from that culture had. He didn't come here till he was about 19 or 20 years old. Um, so, yes, he, he had that sadness in him. Uh, and we grew up with that, too. But he also had incredible faith in the future, even though he suffered all, the, um, all of the tragedies that you described. First, his brother and his wife, his very closest brother dying, and his wife dying at the same time, pretty much. And then we went into the, or we were already in the period of McCarthyism, which I grew up in, uh, where we were, where he had to testify before the committees in the government who were very fascist, the McCarthy committees. And we were afraid of his being deported or imprisoned as many of our friends' fathers were. Mm -hmm. But he was a single father at a time when very few men would have done that. Mm -hmm. So he was a complicated person and he had both sides. And uh, then the beginning of the book and the end of the book is when he's already a grandfather to my first son, who was then only two years old when my father died. But through that experience and through becoming very close to my husband, Mm -hmm. My father also changed and learned a lot about American racism that he didn't understand before either. Mm -hmm. So he was a person who was tremendously able to change and learn and sort of keep his faith mm -hmm. through the tragedies of Stalinism and how that broke apart the, part, the United States Communist Party. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, I, I was thinking about the that beautiful epigraph that you took uh, from a poem by Adam Sagachewski, uh, the one that says, um, try to praise the mutilated world. Oh, yes, I um, always think of that. And he says, you must try to love the mutilated world. <laughs> my father was able to do, I'm not always <laughs> able to do that, but my father is able, was able to do that. It's mm -hmm. hard, it's very hard to do. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, well, at that time during McCarthyism, you uh, you met a lot of artists, uh, communist artists. Can you talk a bit about that? Uh, the artists uh, that you met through your father. The others? Oh, the artists. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So what happened was um, because my father was on the outs in terms mm -hmm. of the leadership. Mm -hmm. of the Communist Party, because he didn't agree with some of their positions. He was put in charge of what they called the cultural region, mm -hmm. which meant he had to teach Marxism to artists and actors and painters and writers, which was very difficult to do because artists are notoriously questioning people. Uh, so they, but they all came into our life at that. Some of them we already were close to but many more came into our life at that time. So even though it was difficult for him, although he ended up having a second marriage to one of them, an actress, mm -hmm. uh, my stepmother, but um, 
it was a blessing for me. It was, my world opened up in a new way. I had a painting teacher because I painted before I became a writer when I was young in high school and college. Um, my stepmother was an actor, actress. Um, I had other very close people in my life who were writers. Mm -hmm. And all of this, all of these people became a part of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, when my father became a part of what they called this, I said, the cultural region of the Communist Party. Mm -hmm. So this was, um, this was a wonderful and fortunate experience for me because it enabled me to begin to understand myself as a writer and as an artist. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. And I, well, I, I have been researching lately about uh, uh, those uh, left-wing women uh, who, who lived uh, through the feminist wave in the 1920s and then went to, to Spain to, to collaborate uh, with the Republicans during the and civil war. I'm really like fascinated with them. And how would you uh, compare um, their feminist engagement uh, no, uh, in the 20s and the 30s uh, with ours nowadays? Uh, it's very complicated, <laughs> I'm sure. Other uh, Others historians and um, historians of that time could describe it much better than I could. But my feeling about it is that a lot of them were very, very admirable activists who wrote, yeah. um, who wrote mostly nonfiction accounts, journalist mm -hmm. accounts. And some of them went to Spain, as you know, and others uh, were in Europe during World War II. Um, and uh, and and tried to expose the dangers of fascism and the uh, horrors mm -hmm. that uh, Jews in Europe were going through, and the communists all over Europe were going through, in Spain and uh, other parts mm -hmm. of Europe, um, and tried to expose the anti-immigration um, forces in this country in America which are now, again, being revitalized in this country. Mm -hmm. But they've always been there. Uh, yeah. For example, Emma Goldman, no? the anarchist who was uh, uh, and with, what? With law. Uh, Emma Goldman, the oh, anarchist, yeah. Emma. Yeah. She, she went to Spain and then she was uh, um, no, with that law. Uh, she had to, she had to, went back to Russia. No? Yes. And uh, I've read her work and I've read her papers and those are um, Meridal Lasser wrote mm -hmm. about it here. Um, many of them, I have tremendous admiration for them. I think what my generation of feminists contributed, uh, which was not emphasized during previous generations, was an analysis of um, women's an analysis of misogyny was intensified and deepened, I think, by my generation, not only by women who were activists and journalists, but women who were psychologists and psychoanalysts and um, writers like Tilly Olson and Grace Paley, um, Alice Walker, others who uh, eventually Toni Morrison most profoundly who, um, but others I'm not mentioning, who uh, added to the um, journalistic history mm -hmm. of feminist women uh, that went back to the beginning of the, cent of the 20th century. Okay. I think my generation added to it a realm of psychological insight about mm -hmm. the impact and effects of and history of misogyny all over the world. Mm -hmm still see it in many countries in the world, including in the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for, for people who, who fight in the, in the Spanish Civil War, the, the Second uh, World War was a, like a deep shock, no? In your, in your book, uh, 
you said your father had a stomach ulcer at that time, no? Uh, it was what? He had a stomach ulcer at that time during the your father. A stomach ulcer? Yeah, something no. like that. No, that no. was later. Later, that was that was later in my life. Uh -huh. uh, that developed. I mean, if you want a psychological theory on my part, my after my father had to actually resign from the Communist mm -hmm. Party. Uh, yeah. he, could, he could not find work because he had no education and he had no work history. So finally mm -hmm. he found work uh, because a friend who was also a former communist owned a cleaning store, mm -hmm. a tailor and cleaning store. My mm -hmm. father became the counterman in that store. Um, mm -hmm. But he was devastated by the fact that he could no longer be an activist. And I think his body responded uh, with um, difficulty to that period mm -hmm. in his, he survived it and he mm -hmm. was okay. But um, we know now, I think what he would not have really understood then, the way our bodies react exactly. to yeah. and trauma in our own yeah. lives. Yeah, it was, I was wondering, yeah, about the, the impacts, the, the effects of history in our bodies, no? Because I have seen similar things here in Argentina, for example, people who became seriously ill uh, during an economical crisis or a military government. Um, so I was thinking, yeah, in, in history, no? Well, in, in, in change choice, Ulysses, Stephen Dedalus said, um, <laughs> history is a nightmare, no? Which I am trying to awake. Yes. Uh, and and what's the meaning of history for you? Okay. And what, sorry? The meaning of history for you? Or? I think I go, I would go back to James Baldwin's statement that I wrote about in A Woman Writer in Time. Mm -hmm. People are trapped in history and history is trapped in them. I think we're all we all have our personal lives that are separate from the collective life that we live. Mm -hmm. And we're all formed and part of the collective life that we live. And trying to bring those two realms together in prose and in poetry uh, is what I have done with my life, to try and bring those two realms together, to understand the way in which I as a person and an individual, but I think very significantly as a mother mm. have been formed and created really by history. Because when I first became a mother, the ideology of the good mother who mm. always would know what to do and who was on the other hand responsible for all the problems that her child had. If your child cried, it was because you did something wrong. If your child uh, had problems growing up, it was because you did something wrong. And that ideology is still very prevalent yeah. in this country and I think throughout the world. So it was really through becoming a mother that I began to, that I began to understand the impact on my own psychological life and even my physical life of uh, my moment in history. Mm -hmm. Where mm -hmm. I was uh, born into the historical moment was at a time when, mm -hmm. very luckily for me, a feminist analysis was beginning to understand the real truth of what it meant to be a mother. Mm -hmm. I was very influenced, by the way, by Sarah Ruddick. I don't know if you know her book, Maternal Thinking. You should mm -hmm. write book down because she has a whole chapter on Argentina and the Argentinian Madres. Um, oh. Yes, and, she, and uh, she was a philosopher. She died years ago. She was a very close friend of mine, but it's a beautiful book about maternal thinking. That's the title of it. Um, and she analyzed in that book uh, many writers, but also uh, some of my work also, my fiction, 
but my novels, but she also analyzed from a philosophical and political point of view, really what it meant to be a mother in history. Okay, sounds great. I will read it. Um, Jane, um, I, uh, it seems to me that your so-called novels, which I didn't read, but, uh, and your so-called memoirs, no? Uh, are related uh, because both uh, narrate uh, situations that come from your personal experience. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering if you see a sharp difference between them uh, and if you apply different uh, methodologies when you start a writing project in each of these genres. On the genres? Yeah. It's a very, um, as I said in the, um, the, the long essay called The Woman Writer in Time, yeah. uh, Una Escritora in El Tiempo in uh, Spanish, that is now coming out. A lot of that essay is about the question you are asking. Mm -hmm. For me, the issue of genre has always been very complicated and overlapped. I have written a couple of novels which are not primarily autobiographical. One is called Inheritance and it's about, it goes back to slavery in this country. Uh, but I always know, even when I'm writing fiction, I always know uh, where the story is coming from in terms of my own life. When I write memoir, when I wrote The Mother Knot, there was not a big deal in this country about genre. I thought I'm writing a novel the way so many women had written autobiographical, or men too, had written autobiographical novels in English and uh, in American literature. Mm -hmm. But it was called a memoir for political reasons. So that was fine with me to publish it as a memoir. And then gradually the whole genre of memoir became politicized in various ways. So mm -hmm. now I just think of myself as writing stories. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they lean more towards a journalistic theoretical voice, mm -hmm. like some of the parts of the communist and the communist daughter. And sometimes they lead more towards traditional story, even mm -hmm. when they're called memoir. Mm -hmm. Whether they're autobiographical or not doesn't really mean much to me. Of course, I write from my own life and my own experience, uh, as most writers do. <laughs> okay. okay. And, and you have wrote a lot about um, your dreams, no? Uh, what, what did you find there? What have you learned from your dreams? You know, the last summer I published a book in English, of uh, my first book of poetry oh. is, is called um, Breaking Light. And uh, years before that, I published a memoir about having cancer and surviving cancer, which was called Wet Earth mm -hmm. and Dreams. Mm -hmm. And uh, the epigraph of Wet Earth and Dreams came from an Adrian Rich poem uh, in which she says, uh, talks about dreams, and the last line is, uh, what have you dug up mm -hmm. in your dreams? So, yes, I dream very vividly <laughs> and very often, and especially when I'm writing, even when I'm writing prose, but certainly in my poetry, but in my prose also, the imagery that uh, comes from my dreams, and so I use my dreams in the memoir that is most recently published. Um, I can't remember if I used my dreams in The Mother Knot. It was so long ago, but- Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I probably I did. Everywhere. <laughs> I probably did because I do, I do think there's, there's an intrinsic relationship between mm -hmm. the way we dream and the way we fantasize and the way we imagine. Mm -hmm. so imagination and experience are not two separate realms with a wall between them. Imagination and experience are 
interwoven. Mm -hmm. And imagination is interwoven with the unconscious and one's dreams. Exactly. For me, they're all uh, connected. Mm -hmm. And you have wrote about the relationship between imagination and memory. Would you yes. Yes. yes, I think that um, all of us are apt to confuse memory with imagination, especially memories from long ago. Mm -hmm. And that's not a bad thing. It's a potentially creative thing. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's sort of um, humbling that you mm -hmm. can't always trust your memories. <laughs> beautiful. Okay, Jane, thank you very much. Uh, um, I think we are, we are done. Uh, well, my thanks, my thanks very deeply to you, Florencia. Yeah. Thank you for your questions and for your work. Yeah. Um, it's been wonderful meeting you. Yeah, you are very, very inspiring and very warm also. So thank you very much, Jane, and we keep in touch. Well, thank you. Well, let's keep in touch for sure. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.